All right, good morning to everyone and welcome to the well here at STSA. Glad to see so many faces here today. I see a lot of new faces that maybe have just uh, are joining us here today for the first time. You're, you're joining, you're tuning in at the end, the finale of a four week series that we've been doing called Confessions of a Bible Power Couple. And what we're doing is we're going behind the scenes. We're getting you the inside scoop on some of the most famous couples in history. Not the ones that are on TV or not the ones that are in Hollywood, the ones whose stories have been told for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And what we're doing is we're looking at these couples and we're trying to see what we can learn from both their positive as well as some of their mistakes. And what we've seen all along is that there isn't any couple that doesn't have any mistakes. But when we learn from them, then hopefully we can apply those lessons in our own lives and we have saved the best couple for last. But before I get to the message, I have a question that I need an answer. I need an answer from you. I need a verbal answer from every single person here. Your answer determines what I say for the rest of the time right here. Do you want a challenging message? You guys ready for a tough message? Who's ready? Who's ready for a challenging message here today in the well at STC? Who's ready for a challenging message? You guys ready for a challenging message? Raise your hand. If you want a challenging message, okay? Very good. So when I give you a challenging message, you ask for it. But before we get to the challenge, let's start light. Okay, again, let's do show of hands. We we're having some fun here today. Show of hands. We're talking about marriage. And the reason why we talk about marriage is because unless you choose a life of celibacy, there's nothing wrong with a life of celibacy. Some people go that route. More power to you. But if you do not choose the path of celibacy, if you're going the path of marriage, there's nothing that is going to contribute to your satisfaction or frustration in life more than marriage. Well, let me ask you a question. You're thinking about marriage, whether you're married or single. How many people, show of hands, plan to commit adultery one day in their marriage? Anybody? Nobody? No one? Just a little cheating on the side and a little action, nothing like that? Okay, how many people, just another show of hands, how many people plan to get married, have many babies, and then go through an ugly divorce? How many people? Anybody? Anybody? No one's plans? Let's see, the, I, the funny thing is that even though none of us raised our hands, 0% raised our hands, statistics say that close to 50% of people will get divorced. And statistics say that almost that same number, maybe just a little bit lower, will commit adultery in their marriage. And I think there's a reason for that. And I think the reason why nobody plans to divorce or commit adultery, but almost 50% of people do commit adultery or divorce, I think the reason is, is because our society today does a horrible, horrible, horrible job of preparing us for marriage. And I think society, in fact, not only doesn't prepare us well for marriage, I think society does a great job of preparing us for a life of divorce. Why? It used to be, back in the old school days, okay, back when you used to live in black and white, four color and all that stuff, it used to be that there were certain things reserved for marriage that weren't done until marriage. It used to be there were certain things that you didn't say until your wedding. It used to be there certain things that you wouldn't see or touch or do until you were married. And it used to be that there was a separation between the two, that there was married life, which was distinctly different than dating life. And people looked forward to that married life because it opened up the opportunity to enter into a new world of activities. Nowadays, no difference. You say the same things before and after marriage. You do the same things. You look at the same things, you touch the same things. In fact, you oftentimes live in the same house. And you got even a spare toothbrush in the place. So then you tell me, what, is, what difference does marriage make? What difference does marriage, what difference does the wedding does? All that happens is there's stuff you do before wedding, and then it's basically the same stuff you do after. There's just like this 45 minute ceremony in between that's just kind of like a, 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 a show. Okay, or just like some kind of, you know, ceremonial thing. But really, your life before and your life after isn't much different. By the time the wedding comes around, you ask for the tough message. By the time the wedding comes around, we have shared all of our lives. We've shared our bodies. We've shared our beds. And like I said, some of us even share in a bathroom and putting a spare toothbrush in each other's bathroom. That sounds like marriage to me. Now you say, hey, wait a minute, Father Anthony. So you're proving yourself wrong. So what you're saying is society is preparing us for marriage. That's a preparation. What you just described as dating is the same as marriage. So society is preparing us for married life. Okay, let's go with that route. 
let's say one day in your pre-marriage life, okay, when you're doing all the married people stuff, but you're not quite married yet, let's say in that life, you get into a fight. You disagree. I yell, she yell, said something we regret, yell, fight. What happens next? What happens then? My, I'm, 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 I'm hurt, I'm crushed, I feel betrayed, he lied, she did, uh, whatever. So what happens next? I take my toothbrush and I go home. And that relationship is now over. And what happens next? Of course, the emotions and you cry and I miss him and I can't live without her and yada, 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 I'm gonna die without them. No one's ever died from a breakup, just so you know. And then eventually you get over it. And then what happens? You go into another relationship, you do more married people stuff, you start living as a married life, and then you get into a fight, you yell, you scream, you take your toothbrush and go home. And every time you do it, it gets a little bit easier to do it again. And after a few years, you've practiced getting married and getting divorced and doing married people stuff and then walking away. And after a few years, you've done two, three, four, you become an, by the time your wedding rolls around, you are an expert at divorce. You know exactly how it goes. I believe, and I hope you'll agree with me, married people will agree that your marriage begins way before your wedding day. Your marriage begins way before your wedding day. And unfortunately for too many of us, we enter marriage ready and prepared to divorce because that's what we've been trained to do. Today, we're gonna hear a story, a beautiful story, a painful story, but a beautiful story about two people who went through some real hard times and had every reason to quit on their marriage and had every reason to walk away, to take their toothbrush and go home. But as we'll see, as God called them to something higher and something better. We're gonna read the story today of Hosea and Gomer. Hosea is a prophet called by God for a very special mission. Gomer is the unfortunate lady who was given a very bad name at birth. And we are going to see that Hosea and Gomer go through a situation that in today's society would have been enough reason to quit, to take my toothbrush and go home. But we'll see how God called them to something much higher. Let's get a little context on the story before we jump in. We're in the year 760 BC, roughly. So we are 800 years before the birth of Christ. The king at the time, his name is Jeroboam II, and Israel is going through a time of prosperity economically. They're flourishing, but spiritually they're declining and they're going down the toilet as so often happens when things go up prosperity wise. Okay, the spirituality goes down. God then calls Hosea and says, Hosea, I got a special mission for you. You're gonna go, I'm gonna raise you up as a prophet and you're gonna preach to my people about the adultery they're committing against me, about spiritual adultery because they're supposed to have no other gods except me and they are cheating on me. So God tells Hosea, that's gonna be your message. But the way you're going to preach it is a slightly unusual way. Pick up the story right here. Hosea chapter one, verse two. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Pause right there. Y'all understand what he's saying? Y'all understand what harlotry means? Harlotry is a uh, soft word, is a like safe for church word. He's basically saying, go downtown and get one of the bad girls, the ladies of the night. Some translations, okay, some biblical translations translate this word W H, and you can fill in the rest. This is what God tells Hosea that I want you to do. Sometimes we read the Bible too fast. Imagine I say to you, here we are at STSA, church is growing, we want to ordain a priest. So we're gonna get this great guy. And this guy is great, but the problem is he's single. Okay, so you need to in the Orthodox Church, you need to be married to be a priest. So I want to get this guy married because I have a great mission for him. He loves God. He's a missionary. He wants to preach. And I tell him, you're a single guy. You're a great guy. Here's what I got you. I got, I got you the perfect wife. The perfect wife. The perfect wife. I want you to go downtown. To that street in Washington. What street is that? What street is that? How do you know what street that is? 
How do you know what street that is? <laughs> How do you know what street that is? I got you. <laughs> I want you to go downtown. <laughs> and I want you to go to that street. And I want you to find that girl. And that's the perfect girl for you. That's the girl I want you to marry. And that's the girl I want you to start life with. What does Hosea do? What would you do? This is what God commands you, single gentleman. What would you do? Well, Hosea. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Without hesitation, he went downtown, got the girl. Her name is Gomer. Kid's name is Diblam or Diblam. I don't know what it is. Okay, sounds like a rapper kind of a thing. Okay, but they had, unfortunately, they had rough names in the Old Testament, but that's okay. He finds Gomer, woman of the night, and says, I want to marry you. And Gomer's like, me? She's confused. She's never had a guy like, what do you want from me? Nothing, I just want to marry you. But you're a good guy, but I'm a bad girl. Everything says that he will have nothing to do with her. So she's like shocked. She's like, all right, what's the deal? What's the deal? And she realizes he's got no deal. She jumps at the opportunity. This guy, like a prince, rides into town, wants to marry me. They get married full of joy, full of happiness. So much happiness, they get pregnant right away. And then they start to get the thing ready for the kid. You know what I mean? Get the nursery room. And then they start to think, okay, what are we gonna name the kid? And then, you know, uh, he says, you know, let's name him this. She's like, no, that was an old boyfriend. Oh, let's name him this, old boyfriend, that, old boyfriend. So they went through all the names. That's why they got to blame. They had to get a name, there was no old boyfriend. They have the baby shower, they paint the room. All is good, right? And then, life hits, just like it did for you. Life hits, that's for every couple, right? He gets a little bit busy at work. She's kind of staying home and asking him to help out. He's not very helpful. She's getting a little resentful. He's getting a little frustrated, you know, like, doesn't she understand? And then she's feeling more and more distant. And then he's feel, feel, feeling more and more frustrated. And he feels unappreciated and she feels neglected. And then the story goes, you know how the story goes? That when they're in this kind of state of distance and not really connected from each other, then all of a sudden what happens? She gets a post on her Instagram from an old boyfriend. And she sees a picture of her and her old boyfriend. Oh, things were great back then, weren't they? Or she's at the gym and the cute guy in the corner gives her a little attention, a little extra attention. Or she's at work. And she's feeling down and her coworker is just so, has such a listening ear. They always have the listening ears, don't they? And the result is this, is that she says, Hosea 2.5, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. After having three children with Hosea, who saved her from the streets, she leaves him. And she goes back her former boyfriend and her former life. And what Gomer did right here, pay close attention here. This applies in every aspect of life, but especially marriage. She believed the biggest lie that the devil gives us. The number one mistake people make in marriage, the number one mistake that people make in marriage and in life is she believed that what I'm missing is better than what I have. That what I'm missing is greater than what I have in front of me. Ladies, you got a husband, not the most romantic guy in the whole wide world. I did absolutely nothing on Valentine's Day. Every year he asks you, what day's your birthday again? Like he's got no clue. But he loves you. And he's a good father. And he provides for the family. And he takes care. Is he 100? No. But what he has versus what he's missing. Gentlemen, she always leaves the light on. Always. Every room she goes, she turns all the light. She never turns the light off. She forgets the oven on all the time. She likes to be a little spendy, especially when she's a little stressed. But she loves you. And she supports you. And she cares for you. And she picks you up when you're down. And she's a mother to your children. I'm not saying she's perfect. I'm not saying she's 100, 
But don't believe the lie that what she's missing is better than what she has. You see, I believe everything in life is this way. I don't think there's anyone that's 100. All my due respect to my wife, okay, she's as close as you get to 100. I don't think anyone's 100. I don't think anyone out there is 100. I think your best bet is 80. And I think everyone out there, every marriage, listen carefully, I know this sounds very unromantic and I'm probably gonna pay the price at home, but this is worth it because it's the truth. Every marriage, it's 80 is what you're going for. Nobody's 100. If you think that your spouse is 100 and will be perfect for you, you are going to destroy your marriage. Let me be clear there. If you think your spouse is supposed to be 100, you are going to destroy your marriage. Not him or not her, you. Your spouse is an 80 at best. And that means that they lack some things, but they provide some things. And you gotta be smart. Is anyone out there, anyone out there dumb enough to say, hey, I'll give you my 80, you give me that 20. Hey, that 20 is so shiny, I'll pay $80 for that 20. You'd be a fool. But I see people do it all the time. I see people do it all the time. As they get so fixated on the 20 that their spouse doesn't provide, that they're willing to trade in the 80 that he or she does. That's what Gomer did. She traded in the 80 and got 20. I think the goal in life is not to get 100. I think the goal in life is to get the 80 and to work to get it to an 82. And then maybe God blessed you and you got it to an 83. Or maybe like grace of God and you got to an 84 or 85. Then you're living the dream, but there are no hundreds out there. But you know the difference between 80 and 20? She traded 80 and she took the 20. 80% is blessed by God. The 80% is a legacy to your children. The 80% doesn't need an explanation when you're looking through the photo albums with your grandkids. The 20% does. The 20% is, well, let me explain. Or the 20% is, well, here's what really happened. 20% comes with an asterisk. But the 80% is a legacy to your children and to their children. The lie is what's, what I'm missing is better than what I have. That's the lie. You want to know the truth? Here's the truth. The truth is you reap where you sow. Not what you sow. You thought I was going to say you reap what you sow, which is true. I'm not saying that's not true. But I believe in addition to reaping what you sow, you reap where you sow. And if all your energy and all your effort is into something outside of your marriage, don't be surprised if you are not reaping fruit because you are not sowing there. This is the part that's really going to get me in trouble with my wife. But I got a lot of points over the past few weeks, so I got some to spare. Oftentimes, I hear the expression, soulmate. He's my soulmate. She's my soulmate. Makes me want to vomit. Because with all my apologies to everyone out there in Hollywood who is pushing this message, I don't believe in soulmates. I never say that Marianne is my soulmate. Love you, honey. <laughs> I never say Marianne is my soulmate. You know what Marianne is? She's my best friend. She's the most godly woman I know. She's the person that I want to raise my children. Uh, she's the person I want by my side for the rest of my life. But she's not my soulmate. You know what soulmate is? Soulmate, anytime I've ever heard it, it is a justification or an excuse to do something ungodly and unwise. Anytime soulmate crosses your lips, it's to justify something that you know you shouldn't do. I was on an airplane past, this past week. I, counted, I, I was on an airplane for 40 hours this past week, from, the la, from last Saturday to, to this past Friday, seven days, 40 hours on an airplane, which means I watched a lot of movies. I know every movie that's out there. I couldn't remember any of the titles or anything, but I know a lot of movies. There was one that I saw. This was just one that I took note of, but there was like three or four exactly like it. Because you know how you push on the thing and it gives you a little description, okay, in like two sentences? You know, a married woman, you know, uh, uh, meets, you know, her, the man of her dreams and falls in love and has to decide what to do to go to her husband or the man of her dreams. What garbage is that? What kind of garbage is that? What should she do? She should go back to her husband because she married him and she was joined at the altar and she in front of God said, that's the man I spend the rest of my life with. It's not a decision. Soulmate. Soulmate is garbage. You know what soulmate? Let me tell you this. You reap where you sow. You know how the expression, the grass is greener on the other side? The grass is not greener on the other side. You know where the grass is greener? Wherever you water it. 
So if you are always looking over your neighbor's fence to check out his grass, and you are leaving your own grass untouched, yes, your grass will stink, but it's because you didn't water it, not because the grass doesn't, can't grow. Back to Hosea, sorry. Get myself a little worked up here. Stupid movies. Back to Hosea. Hosea, called by God, woman of the night, goes for no reason, nothing for him. He, he picks her up and he takes her and he's in love with her. And he's going to have a babies with her and he has second baby and third baby. And then she walks away from him. Hosea now has two options. Hosea has two options. Every married couple, you have these same two options. And God is telling this story, could just as it before we get back into it. God is telling this story of Hosea and Gomer as a symbol of God and Israel. So what I'm saying now about Hosea has two options with Gomer, God has two options with Israel. God has two options with us when we commit adultery and we walk away from him. And God has two options, just like Hosea had two options. The first option is to walk away. And God could have walked away from Israel. Nobody would have blamed God if God would have walked away. And you people, y'all were slaves. Y'all were crying for me. And I came and rescued you. And I brought a part of the Red Sea. And I fed you in the wilderness. And I brought you to the promised land. And I gave you everything. And I only said one thing I needed from you. I'm your God. You're my people. No other gods besides me. And y'all broke it and you cheated on me. Nobody would blame God if he gave up on Israel. And nobody would blame Hosea if he gave up on Gomer. She was a prostitute. He was the good dude. He rescued her. He saved her. He had every right to walk away. Hosea chapter 2, verse 8. God again talking about Israel and Hosea about Gomer. Okay, saying about he had the option to walk away. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Basically, God is saying, I did and I did and I did. And that's what she did. So she walked away. Watch what I'm going to do. And I'm going to and I'm going to. And I, I don't want you to get a picture of like an angry God. It's not angry, but I want you to get the picture that God is not a robot. That God is not a set of rules. God is a person. So you feel a little emotion right here. Because God is, don't, don't make him too robotic right here. God is a person. And he's saying, she did and she did and she did and she did. This is what she deserves. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall deliver her from my hand. I will punish her for the days of the Baal, that's the false god to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, says the Lord. Do you hear the hurt? Do you hear it? But me, she forgot. She didn't want me. She chose others. She walked away. I didn't do nothing but good for her. When it says, I will punish her, okay, realize one thing, just, just because I don't like us to get confused. God doesn't punish us in the way that like here. God punishes us in the same way that parents punish their children for touching a hot stove. In a child's mind, my parents are burning my hand because I touched the stove. Are the parents really burning the hand of the child for touching the stove? No, it's just the consequence of your actions. So God in the same way, God is not saying, I'm gonna stick it to them and I'm going to. What God is saying is when y'all walk away, realize you're going to suffer. Back to the story of the prodigal son. You remember the story of the prodigal son, the man with the two sons and the one son who left? He didn't punish him by taking away all his money. By him leaving the father, he punished himself. And that's what God is saying right here. And I think, forgive me, remember we asked for the tough message? I think a lot of homes today understand this message. Because there's a lot of homes today, a lot of marriages today, that are basically said to God, we don't need you. We're good. We don't pray. We don't have no Bible in our house. Look, we're good, but we're not bad people. But we're, we're, we're okay. God isn't really a part of the day-to-day -day stuff. There's no humility. There's no apologizing. There's no selflessness. There's a lot of me. There's a lot of ego. There's a lot of money, 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 money. Work, 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 work. I need a car. I need a phone. I need a house. And what God is saying to you, just like he's saying right here, okay, tell me if the car gives you peace. 
Tell me if the bigger house fills it automatically comes with filled with love. Tell me if the new job will give you the joy that you're looking for. Go ahead. Whenever someone buys a new house, we go into a prayer of a blessing for the new home. And we read a certain passage from the scripture there, which is Luke 19, which is the story of Zacchaeus. When Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home, and he said to him, today's salvation has come to this household. Because Zacchaeus was a bad dude who did bad stuff. And then he invited Jesus to come to his home. And Jesus said, today's salvation has come to this house. And I think there's a lot of homes today, forgive me, y'all asked for the tough message. I think there's a lot of homes today that need to repent and say, Jesus, we've been trying to do this without you. And Jesus, we want you in our house. We want the sin out. We want the greed out. The ego, the pride, the, I'm, I'm not going to apologize, like that stuff. We can get rid of that stuff because we need you, Jesus, in this house. The people cheated on God. Gomer cheated on Hosea. God had a right to take his toothbrush and go home, and so did Hosea. But both of them chose option number two. Instead of walk away, they chose to fight through. They chose to fight through. Now, the last verse I just showed you, that was verse 13. God said, I will punish them. You remember that, right? Okay, it was just one verse ago. He said, I will punish them. That was verse 13. Watch verse 14. Therefore, completely out of the blue, therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth. Where did this verse come from? I'm going to punish and I'm going to uh, uncover and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Okay, I changed my mind. I'm going to allure her. I'm going to bring her into the wilderness. You know what the wilderness means? Why wilderness? Why do you want to bring her in the wilderness? I want to bring her away. Get her away from all those men, all those temptations, just to myself, just me and her. I'm going to sweet talk her. I'm going to allure her. I'm going to draw her into the wilderness. I must be comfort to her. And there, the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Achor means trouble. And what God says here is that we have seen some trouble. Hosea and Gomer, you've seen some trouble. Me and Israel, we've seen some trouble. But as we journey through that valley together, it will lead us to a door of hope. You see, there's two, great, there's two ways to have a great marriage. Only two ways. Option number one, never ever mess up. Good luck to you. If you're already married more than a day, that option's out the window. Option number two is mess up. Not on purpose, but it's inevitable. Apologize, repent, and grab hold of one another's hand and walk through the valley of Achor together knowing 100% that if we journey together, if we hold hand in hand, and we journey through this valley of Achor, it will always, always, always turn into a door of hope. <clears throat> I promise you, married people, hanging by a thread today, I promise you, I know marriages that have seen some very difficult times. Betrayal, deceit, lying, stealing. Like I've seen marriages go through very difficult times. And I've seen them hand in hand through the Valley of Acord turn into a door of hope. Not overnight, not in a week or a month, but I promise you this, I promise you this, I promise you this, that any marriage where there are two people who are willing to travel through the Valley of Acord, I promise you, as long as there's a God in heaven, and two people on earth who are willing to work, I promise you door of hope. I promise you door of hope. As long as there's a God in heaven. Is there a God in heaven? Absolutely. And as long as there's two people who are willing, I promise you door of hope. No matter what it is. Now you say, well, he's not willing or she's not willing. Are right, you know what you're going to do in that situation? You're going to walk. Are you going to walk like this? With your hand out. Ready. 
at any moment in time. And you're going to be loving, and you're going to be forgiving where needed. You're going to walk with that hand open, ready to journey to the Valley of Acor. The story wraps up with God telling Hosea, you thought what God told Hosea was incredible already? You ain't seen nothing yet. Look what he says now. After Hosea has done everything right, after Hosea has saved this woman, she cheated on him and she left him. And she's now back to the prostituting lifestyle. What God tells Hosea is impossible. But look what he says. Hosea 3.1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. God is saying, I know what she's doing. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. What is God telling Hosea to do? He is telling him to love and forgive as he's been loved and forgiven. And I know it said love, it didn't say forgive, but I'm throwing forgive in there because I think that's important. God, you want me to forgive her and to love her even though I did everything right and she did everything wrong. It's impossible. It's crazy. It's outlandish. And God's answer to Hosea is what? That's exactly how I love you. I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't already done for you. Forget about the Israelites for a second. Let's talk about ourselves. We choose to serve other masters all the time over God. God is never priority number one unless we're in a disaster. We constantly get distracted. We constantly push him to the side. And what does he do? He loves us and he forgives us back. And now... He's challenging us to do the same in our marriages. Does this mean, let me go through the caveats right here. Does this mean I love him and forgive him or I love her and forgive her and I'm a doormat for the rest of my life? No. Love and forgive may mean new, some new set of rules. Like I'm sure Gomer, there was a new set of rules about which parts of the town she could and couldn't go to. I'm sure there were some relationships that needed to end. I'm sure there could be a new way that this is how we're going to operate from now on. We're going we're to pray together every day and we're going to make sure that we don't do certain things. Yeah, no, there could be new rules. But what it means is, it means that I'm not going to quit without a fight. That I'm going to do everything that I can in my power to make this thing work. See, that's the opposite of the divorce culture we live in. The culture we live in today is when it gets hard, quit. When it becomes difficult, walk away. Take your toothbrush and go home. But that's not what God is calling us to. Saying when it gets difficult, keep fighting. And it gets more difficult, you fight more. Another caveat. Does this mean if I do this, Father Anthony, I'll never get divorced? Does this mean everything will always work out? I wish I could say that. But the answer is I can't. Truth of the matter is I said there's got to be a God in heaven and two willing parties. And God knows. This is not a message to condemn any divorced people, okay? Because God knows that some of you listening to this message, you did everything that you could. You fought your guts out and you did everything in your power to fight, 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 but you're only half of the equation. So this is not in any way a condemnation for those who have gone through divorce. But what this is saying is, is that if we go through divorce, if divorce happens, it won't be because I didn't fight. It won't be because I didn't do everything in my power. I can't control the other person. But I'm going to fight my guts out. And I'm going to love as God loved me. Because God could have quit on me, and he didn't. And God could have walked away from me, but he didn't. And God could have left me in my horrible state of sin, but he didn't. And now he's the one asking me to do the same. He's asking me to love and forgive and to fight for a spouse who may have hurt me the same way he fought for me when I hurt him. And I let him down and he didn't give up on me and maybe you have a spouse who's let you down. But we're not gonna give up on them. Tough message? You asked for it. I realize it's not an easy topic. And I realize that some of you are thinking, some of you are sitting there thinking, it's easy for you to say, Father Anthony, you got a great wife. You got a perfect life. Everything is perfect in your life. 
You got no problems. I agree with half of that statement. I do have the best wife in the whole wide world, but I don't agree with the second half, that we got no problems. I don't agree with the second half that says we got a life easy. You think it's easy doing what I do right here? You think it's easy that every single person who's sitting right here and even people on this camera and people from all over reach out all the time? You think it's easy that sometimes my wife and I will travel and people will come up and basically act as if they're my best friend and she don't even know who she is, push her to the side? You think that's easy? You think it's easy? Look, she got a full-time job, all right? In addition to her full-time job at work, she has to take care of me. You think that's easy? You think we got no problems? We got kids. Kids equal problems. But you know what else we got? We got hand in hand through the Valley of Acre. Not once, not twice, not three times, but 18 years and counting that we have walked through the Valley of Acor together and we have never let go of each other's hands. Not that we never had trouble. Not that we never had situations where, 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 where difficult situations. But we walk hand in hand, one hand with each other, the other hand with God, and every single time we end at the door of hope. story goes on, finishes basically. The prophet goes, Hosea goes back to Gomer. She's living the prostituting life. And now, forgive the expression, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, okay? Now he has to buy her off from the pimp. I don't know if there's a better way to say pimp. If that's allowed, that's going to get censored out or not. But I don't know. If someone knows the more accurate word for that, like, please let me know. But basically, she's working for the guy. And Hosea now has to buy her back with his own money. With his own money, he has to purchase his wife back, and he brings her back into the house. I don't know how the marriage ends. The scripture doesn't tell us. But I can't imagine in a million years, after what he did for her, twice, after he purchased her, that she would ever walk away again. Can you? For you, you and me, we're also bought. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Just as Gomer was purchased out of sin and slavery and death, so were we. And just as Gomer is indebted to Hosea forever, so are we. I don't know how Gomer and Hosea's marriage ends. Scripture doesn't tell us. And I don't know how your marriage is going to end. But I'm telling you, after you've been purchased and bought by God, like now it's our turn. Now it's our turn to fight the way he fought for us. As we wrap up the series, I want to invite our music team to come back on stage because we like to end in a nice song. As we wrap up, as I said, all of us are Gomer. All of us. He's given everything he has for us. He's laid down his life for us, even though we didn't deserve it. Now, he's challenging us to do the same in our marriages. And I want to show you something up here on the screen, okay? I want to show you something up here on the screen, which I wasn't planning on showing. The presentation was supposed to end here. And then I got an email yesterday, not an email, but like a, I subscribed to this blog. It's called Art of Manliness. Anyone on Art of Manliness? Okay, it's a great blog, okay, Art of Manliness. And they had something on there, advice to newly married. And it was an article that was written in the year 1920. Again, the black and white era when marriage was different. And I thought it was so good that I want to share it. It's kind of long, okay, but it's going to be up on the screen. So follow with me. I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to show it. Then we're going to sing a song and say a prayer. But I want you, if you're married, to pay close attention. If you're not married, I still want you to pay close attention because this is what Marriage truly is all about. Now, young folks, you're just fresh married. You're happy as June bugs. Life seems one infinite rimless custard pie. Again, it's a 1920 kind of a thing, so excuse the expression, okay? Joy and gladness seem to have moved in to stay, occupying the front room and being present at all meals. I'm not going to give you a lot of advice, but just one piece, small enough to take, to remember, and to practice. So just hold hands a spell, withdraw your beaming eyes from each other's countenance, move your ears forward and listen. 
You're going to have trouble because you're human. And man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward, as the scripture says. You won't always be happy. You won't, you'll have your share of weeping and your hearts will quake when their turn comes. Break, maybe. You too will walk the floor of nights or lie abed looking red-eyed up at the dark, just as your mother, father, grandparents, and ancestors on back to Adam have done. When that time comes, I want you to remember this one thing. One thing and worth $1 million. It is this. Are you listening? Don't let any trouble get between you. The accent or emphasis is on the word between. All the trouble in the world is not going to bother you so long as it is on the outside. You'll have enemies, but none of them can hurt you if they do not get between you. You'll have disappointments, bereavements, disillusions, failures, regrets, mistakes, angers, and resentments. And you can resist seven tons of such stuff provided you stand together and don't let any of it seep in between your two hearts. Be partners, be allies, and swear never, either one of you, to make a separate treaty with the enemy. Don't have secrets from, one the, from, from the other. Organize your own oath-bound secret society now. Lock yourselves in and the rest of the world, even darling mother-in-law. Sorry. Beware of the intimate friend to whom you tell things about your wedded companion. Said intimate friend has broken up more couples than any other known snake. Be your own intimate friends. Gossip, tattle, and tell all you know to each other, all you please, but not about each other to any third party. Remember that three is a fearful crowd when it comes to married folk. When trials come or even poverty, loss, or debt, just cuddle up closer together and you can laugh at them. Don't let the darkness of dark days get in between you and separate you. Don't even let your children, when they come, and I hope there'll be a lot of them, get between you and alienate you. That sometimes happens. Remember, one thing only I've told you. Write it down, hang it up on your wall. There's bitterness in this world, but it can't make us bitter, but doesn't come between us. You've sworn till death do us part, and for better or worse, stick to it. Let's stand together.